What's up everyone? My name is Nick and today I'm exploring Peninsula Malaysia. I've left Kuala Lumpur this morning and we're driving up north, we're driving west and we're just gonna have a great time today. So let's get this video started. So, well, let's get started right here. I'm at a really cool temple here. I truthfully have no idea where I am and there's a little cute doggy. So uh, yeah, this is Global Given. Let's go. <laughs> So you might be wondering, Nick, what are you doing at a Chinese temple today? Well, this is actually a stopover to our first destination, which is a sturgeon farm, a fish farm, but not just any kind of fish. This fish lays eggs, as most fish do, and these eggs are then turned into caviar. So that's where we're going. We're gonna check out a caviar farm. Let's go. Right, so here I am somewhere north of Kuala Lumpur at the only sturgeon farm in all of Malaysia. And uh, you might uh, be thinking, oh cool, I want to visit that place. Well, that's not that easy because, well, I don't know where I am. Somewhere up north, maybe an hour from Kuala Lumpur, an hour and a half, and this place is not really open to public. So I am super happy to be here. Let's uh, see some fish. I have to be honest, I have never seen this fish before, the sturgeon, and the cool thing is when they eat, they swim and then they just turn their whole body upside down to grab the food from the surface. That's such a cool, such a cool fish. So the fish come in here as fries, as little baby fish, and then they're put in these tanks and they have to acclimatize because these fish are originally from China and they live in the cooler areas of China. So the fish is used to cold water. So when the fish come here, the water has to be cold and after about three months, then they move into these bathtubs. And of course, the temperature slowly increases here to acclimatize these fish to the hot Malaysian weather. And after about six to nine months, then they can live in the normal water in the bigger outdoor tanks. And then they can grow and grow and grow. And I've heard that at one point, these fish can gain up to a kilo per month. So I'm really curious to see where these big, big fish are. <laughs> So they don't only breed sturgeons here at this farm, but also tilapia, and I saw some uh, shrimps as well. And uh, I believe, what? Oh my God, fish in here, they're huge. Hey. All right, so behind me, we've got some monsters. Look at how big those fish are. I mean, they're, they're almost as tall as I am. So uh, these are about how many kilos? 40 kilos. One fish. What? Okay, this is silly. I thought I'd seen the biggest fish here, but the owner just said that those fish were the midgets. What the, What is the biggest fish here gonna look like that? Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. <laughs> Look at this monster. It doesn't even fit on my screen. Whoa, it's as big as a shark. So these are the giants. They're not 40 kilos. They're not 50 kilos. They are over 100 kilos. Hey, buddy. Boy, should have brought my swim shorts. <laughs> right, so I'm in the clean room here where they actually collect the eggs, the caviar out of the fish. And I didn't know this but they would scan the fish from the pond, they would scan it and see if there's eggs inside. And if there is, if there are eggs inside, they bring the fish here through that door, they put it in, they will cut open the fish and then take all the eggs out. And unfortunately, something I didn't know, the fish then obviously dies. 
And why is caviar so expensive? Because it takes about four years here, normally about eight years, to grow one fish to get some caviar out of it. So the fish dies and it takes four years at least to find a fish that has caviar fish eggs inside of it. I'm learning so much today. So when we slice it here, all the egg will be good down. Yep. So depending on what the customer is asking for, they can either put sea salt, Himalayan salt, and even barrio salt together with the caviar. Yummy. All right, so I've got one tin of the Kaluga caviar here, and one tin goes for about four to 500 ringgit. That's about $100 for this tin. Mm-hmm, uh-huh, yes, uh-huh. All right, so before heading off, the uh, manager here told me something interesting because there's mountains around here and a lot of forests. So once in a while, they see the Malayan tiger coming onto their property. Yes, that's cool. That's so cool. All right, so we're in the car now and we're heading to the west coast of Peninsula Malaysia and we're making our way to an area called Sukin Chan. And Sukin Chan is famous, very, very famous for its many, 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 many paddy fields. How many? Many. So the name Sukin Chan came from a Chinese dialect and it means fertile land. So anything you plant, rose. And you can see that here because there are so many paddy fields. Wow. So besides having the amazing paddy fields here in Sukin Chan, they also have an incredible fishing industry here. There are one, two, three, four, five, hundreds of fishing boats, as the sea is right there. And yes, Sikin Chan is famous for rice and for fish. What else do you need, right? <laughs> Okay, now guess, guess where I am. I'm at Redang Island. No, I'm at Pantai Redang. Sounds like Redang Island, which is one of the nicer islands here in West Malaysia. But today I'm just visiting Pantai Redang here in Sukin Chan. And uh, it's good times here. It's nice, nice to see the sea. Wow. I mean, this is what I love to do the most. I love uh, exploring. And uh, I must say that I've been to West Malaysia many times, but I have not explored enough. So, that's uh, definitely something I'm gonna do more in the future. Next time I'll definitely bring my wife and my son Milo, because it's always more fun to explore areas with your family. Yeah, I like Sikin Chan. There's a lot of fresh seafood here. There's a, a decent beach, and it just feels like a very chill place. Whoa! There's even a temple here with a huge tree and hundreds if not thousands of ribbons on the branches. <laughs> so this tree behind me is a very popular spot and you get a ribbon, you put your wish on there and you just tie it up on the tree and then hopefully your wish comes true. Hey guys, how's it hanging? Good? Monkeys. Beep boop. Hi buddy. All right, a little fun fact for you here. This lighthouse was originally built by the Dutch, yes, my great, 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 great grandfathers, back in the 17th century. Now, later on, the British reconstructed this uh, lighthouse in 1907. Yes, that's a little fun fact for you. All right, all right, so do you know what this is? Yes, this is a cannon 
A Dutch cannon, because it says VOC, VOC, the Verenigd Oost Indische Compagnie. So these are 100 year old cannons. Still here in Malaysia. All right, I guess it's time to feed the monkeys. Oh, there he is. Hello. <laughs> oh, another one here on my hip. <laughs> How's that taste? Good? There you go. You're welcome. Say, everyone subscribe to Global Gibbon. Billy, you want to say anything to your friends and family back home? You smell nice. Ah. <laughs> this is so cool. All right, that's it. I've arrived at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport and I'm ready for my flight back home to Kuching in Sarawak. I've had a lot of fun here in Kuala Lumpur and I uh, can't wait to come back with my wife and my son. But now it's time to go home and this is the end of the video. So if you like this video, leave a like, leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. That's it for now, I guess. All right, bye-bye. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.